Less than two months ago, on June 5, 2012, IPI co-organized with the permanent mission of Germany under SRSG's office, a policy forum entitled Beyond CUNY 2012. The panelists, featuring among others Madame Kumaraswamy, but also Madame Grace Akalo, a former child soldier, discussed ways to better protect children from the horrendous crimes committed by the notorious Lord Resistance Army. It is, it is therefore indeed both an honor and a real pleasure to host Madame Kumaraswamy Kumar one last time for a farewell discussion before she gives the reign to, uh, of the SRSG's office to her newly appointed successor, Madame Leila Zerogi. Without any further delay, I would like to pass the floor uh, to our co-host and moderator for today's event, Ambassador Jan Grohls, permanent representative of Belgium to the United Nations, who will introduce more in depth our featured speakers. Ambassador Grohls, of whom you will find a full biography in your papers, has had a distinguished career with the Belgian diplomatic service for nearly 40 years, or exactly 40 years, you told me, um, in various capacities and postings. He has been in his current position for the last four, year, four years, since June 2008, when he was also elected chair of the country-specific configuration of the Peacebuilding Commission for the Central African Republic. Ambassador Grohls, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Jeremy, and uh, welcome to, to all of you. Uh, it's a full room, which is uh, good. Uh, it's like in, uh, it's, it's the name of uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy who attracted uh, so many people to, to this event. And uh, for the Belgian mission, it's a special honor and privilege uh, and pleasure, if I may say so, to uh, 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 host uh, this event together with, uh, with IPI. And, and, and thank you to IPI for um, making this, this, this possible. I'm supposed to uh, introduce the two guests uh, of today. Uh, of course, uh, Radhika has been uh, introduced already uh, by Jeremy, and in fact, she doesn't need to be uh, introduced, uh, particularly here in New York. Uh, we know her so well and uh, uh, her achievements, and I think we are all we consider ourselves as great admirers of uh, what she has been doing uh, over the last uh, last years, really great admirers, and uh, I myself also, I had the privilege of working with her and with her staff over the last years very closely. It's always been a, a very pleasure, a great pleasure to, to do so. So thank you very much uh, for being here, and uh, as Jeremy said, this is your very last uh, official uh, um, uh, or, or it's your last presence uh, as, uh, as an official of, of, the, of the United Nations, and that's the reason why we decided to call this uh, farewell, uh, a farewell uh, conversation with uh, Radhika. Uh, the other guest uh, of today is uh, a compatriot of mine, uh, Lucas Perron, who is sitting uh, over here. Perhaps you can just stand up. Uh, uh, um, uh, and he will offer uh, some commentaries uh, uh, from the field, uh, from his uh, field experience. Uh, Lucas Perron is here in his capacity uh, uh, of director of Music Fund, and Music Fund is a Belgian non-profit uh, organization uh, that uses uh, music uh, to bring together uh, people and communities and populations uh, that have been in conflict, and uh, Lucas is doing that in places such as uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, and also other places. So these are our two guests. Um, let me perhaps now turn to uh, Radhika, uh, asking her to reflect perhaps a bit uh, upon her experiences uh, of the last years as special uh, uh, representative of the Secretary General for Children and armed uh, conflict. Uh, I guess um, that she will want to concentrate perhaps on, on two issues uh, more particularly, uh, the one being the, the human cost, uh, the human cost of uh, violations against uh, children during uh, conflict, uh, armed conflict, and the other one, uh, of course, the need for healing and, and reconciliation, which is also a very important um, aspect. Uh, as this is a farewell, perhaps two questions, if I may, uh, uh, Radhika. First of all, um, 
looking back upon these uh, six years, uh, what are uh, what do you consider as your successes? Uh, what have been your challenges and difficult moments? How do you see uh, the way forward? And what recommendations uh, would you have for your uh, successor, which in the meantime, as uh, Jeremy already mentioned, has been uh, uh, appointed? So that would be a first question. Looking back, uh, what do you have to say on, 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 on your experiences and, and achievements? And the other question um, I would like to raise is, um, in your work, you have focused a lot on a uh, key element, and rightly so, the key element of, uh, of uh, accountability. Uh, but more recently, you have also drawn the attention uh, to uh, other issues, uh, such as healing and, and reconciliation. And could you perhaps um, tell us a bit more about that? How do you see that? Uh, 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 and, and, and how do you see uh, uh, children coming uh, to terms uh, with the violations uh, uh, they suffered? So these are two questions I would like to uh, uh, ask you just in order to uh, launch a debate. But first of all, I want to give the floor to you. And thank you again for being here, Rodita. Thank you, Ambassador Grauls. Belgium has been an absolute uh, supporter of this mandate and these issues. And during your time on the Security Council, uh, really a very uh, strong uh, uh, partner in these issues, and I want to thank you for that uh, uh, and put that on record as well. Um, and I also want to thank IPI for inviting me many times. This is the forum where we relax and reflect on things that really uh, sometimes we don't have to, time to do when we're rushing around from meeting to meeting. So thank you for providing us with that forum. Um, let me just begin by proud to tell you that today is precisely the seventh anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1612. So I feel a certain closure that I should leave uh, or make this final con conversation since I took office just after that resolution was passed. Um, we have also, to celebrate this occasion, relaunched our website. Uh, so I would like urge you to go look at the uh, website. It's in a new format and would be, uh, I think, very much uh, with new, many new features uh, which will make the information much more accessible. I hope uh, that uh, as my farewell, I, I thought that I would put up all the information that we have managed to uh, take in the last six years. Now, in response uh, to your questions, Ambassador Grouse, uh, this is a farewell conversation. I don't want it to be only a one-sided conversation, but I did. Uh, I thought I would, as I say, reflect first on on what happened in the last six years and what are the successes. In many ways, I, I inherited a vision. Um, uh, this vision began with Grasse Michelle, who put this whole issue of children in armed conflict in, in that study that she wrote. And then my predecessor, Olara Tuno, who, uh, assisted by people like the Ambassador de la Sable of France uh, and the Ambassador Benin, I think um, decided to really make children and armed conflict a peace and security issue and a major thematic issue of the Security Council. Um, and that perpetrators of grave violations against children should either be shamed through lists of shame or be punished. Um, and also, I think uh, uh, this vision, uh, which is unique in a way, calling on the Security Council to play a particular kind of thematic role, it was, I think, quite brilliant. And I have to say it was not mine. It was my predecessors. It was Mr. Olaro Tuno. Uh, my task was really to implement this vision, because he left just after 1612 was, uh, was passed. Um, and basically, what we've done in implementing this vision is first to create and implement with, especially UNICEF, a monitoring and reporting system for the Security Council in situations uh, around the world. Uh, it, it is, for the most part, included uh, by the creation of a country-level task forces that gather information with all the main UN actors as well as UN partners, uh, UN partners on the ground and also coordinated at headquarters uh, through a task force. I must say that uh, we have worked very, uh, 
closely with UNICEF and DPKO in training of child protection teams, of guidelines, of templates, of sending channels of communication, of uh, annual uh, report communication. I mean, basically trying to put this system of monitoring and reporting in place, which will be the first of its kind of the Security Council. We have had quite a few successes. Uh, if you look at this year's report and last year's report, you can see the richness of the material that's coming out in some sense, uh, and in that sense, but we still, of course, have a lot to do, and that's one of the things I'm sure my successor will address. We also serve as this working group on children in armed conflict with country reports and global horizontal notes, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, we have strengthened the listing process of the Security Council uh, situation, where earlier my predecessor had managed to get the council to list those who recruit and use children uh, for armed conflict. Over the last six years, we've managed to expand the triggers to include those who list, those who commit uh, 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 sexual violence against children, kill and maim children contrary to international law, and those who uh, attack schools and hospitals. We have also implemented, uh, according to the Security Council process, you have to enter into an action plan to be delisted, uh, and we have managed over the last six years to sign 19 action plans. That's still a tip of the iceberg, but it is something. And most governments uh, who are on the list have signed or are in the process of signing uh, this action plan. So as I was uh, telling Leila Zarugi in a VTC, let's hope that by 2016, we can make sure that there are no governments in the world, no our national armies that recruit children. We have also worked with non-state actors. One of the high points of my visit, uh, uh, of my uh, tenure was the visit to Nepal uh, for example, uh, the MILF uh, in the Central African Republic, going and meeting many of these uh, armed groups uh, and uh, convincing them to enter into the uh, Security Council uh, process. And uh, with regard to uh, punishment also, which was one of the parts of that vision, we have begun tentatively in the Security Council process to uh, work with the sanctions committees to uh, uh, have sanctions against particular individuals, uh, especially in the DRC, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, we've also, uh, we have to develop those linkages quietly and see what other uh, measures can also be taken against persistent perpetrators. And also, we work closely with the ICC. Uh, the first case, that when I came into office, the first case that the prosecutor decided to prosecute was a case on children, uh, style soldiers. So we filed an amicus curiae, uh, we, I gave legal testimony, and we were happy to see that, uh, that, that the testimony, which is around the whole issue of what constitutes enlistment, conscription, and taking part actively in hostilities, that our legal opinion was taken into consideration by the court and is reflected uh, in its opinion. Let me just say, uh, my successor, I think the challenges that she would face, I think, um, are twofold. Um, one, one of the other things, before I go on to what is, is that we've managed to, I think, mainstream this issue within the UN system quite significantly, though still some work needs to be done uh, in DPKO and uh, DPA now. There are child protection policies. Uh, UNICEF, of course, is taking the lead. And many uh, other organizations, now WHO, UNESCO, all beginning to look at this issue uh, as, the, as the violations now include attack schools and hospitals. Uh, and that, I think, especially when I met with the task force for the last time, I realized how much uh, UN agencies have really taken this on board and how committed many of them are now uh, to these issues. Finally, with regard to my successor, um, I, would, I would urge her basically um, uh, one issue is to galvanize the political will around this ish office again, uh, get a re uh, to get uh, more support from African and Asian countries uh, for this mandate. Uh, and I think uh, coming in new uh, and with many linkages to the AU and uh, especially she, she's from Algeria, this will be something that is really quite possible. Uh, and I hope that she will go ahead uh, with that. The second is to consolidate the monitoring and reporting system and the work already done. As you know, uh, I have a superb staff. Uh, they're, they're really, I think, one of the best teams in the UN. So I hope she would uh, use them and help 
uh, monitor and report uh, uh, this uh, strengthen the monitoring and reporting process and work closely with them and accelerate action plans also with the non-state actors uh, i think that also needs to be done in all this i would refer her to ambassador de la sablier's report uh, and some of the issues that were raised in that report um, so these are some of the concerns if you ask me uh, uh, the highlights uh, the highlights are, of course, the Security Council resolutions being passed in two years. Uh, uh, highlights are the field visits, uh, which have uh, galvanized in action plans, uh, and also, uh, I think, uh, the uh, Lubanga judgment, uh, which we were very happy to see uh, the, the office immortalized now in the legal records of the, of the, of the um, uh, court. Now, to regard to your second question, sometimes member states and sometimes even individuals says, why are you so concerned with accountability and punishing people? It seems, you know, sort of this uh, accountability strength. And let me say this, that to me, it was very clear, and I think to my predecessor, that the comparative advantage of this office, UNICEF is there to do the programs and the really uh, important uh, programmatic work. And, and I think nobody can replicate that. I think what we are comparative advantage is to take the political heat and to take the monitoring and reporting part of this so that they can do their humanitarian work. And so the comparative advantage of the office was to focus on accountability, monitoring and reporting. And that was also something when Grasa Michel wrote a report, which was the most horrific part of this armed conflict situation, were the terrible violations against children. Uh, uh, so I think that's one. Secondly, uh, Elizabeth Wood, a uh, researcher at New Haven, uh, and many of her work shows to the point that actually in these, in these issues, perpetrators have a choice. In the same region, you will find one group that recruits children, one group that doesn't. One group that commits sexual violence, one group that doesn't. So there, there is a choice in, by these uh, leaders of these armed groups to engage in these practices. And somehow we must make sure that they are deterred from making that choice. And you can only do that through punishment, either at the ICC or uh, through Security Council sanctions. And I have seen this deterrence face to face. When I meet these people and tell them they're on a Security Council list, I can testify, and I think all my staff can testify, as well as UNICEF people who have gone in the field, that when you tell them they're on a Security Council list, they sit up and listen. And many of them want to get off that list. Of course, there are groups such as, say, Al-Shabaab and the Taliban who don't care about the international community. But anybody who cares about the international community does not want to be on a list. Uh, and so I, think, um, so I think accountability and punishment are important. But I agree that it must be punishment plus. And that's why I thought uh, quickly uh, to say, what is the plus here? And one is, of course, prevention. Our office, I have started a process where we would have uh, a working paper hopefully out by the end of uh, this year on the whole issue of prevention, uh, working on political and legal aspects, uh, com economic and social aspects, as well as the development of community networks. But it's also about healing uh, and reintegration. The strongest memories I have of this tenure are the children that I have met in the field. Uh, the first, for example, Moy from Northern Uganda, who was playing with his friend uh, until somebody, uh, uh, until the LRA came and basically abducted him, took, in, took him into the uh, uh, bush. Uh, he was, uh, his friend twisted an ankle. He watched his friend being killed. He himself was subject to, horrible uh, tortures and uh, brainwashing and made to attack the same village and the same families that he, he came, uh, came from. And then when I met him, he was heartbroken because his father, whom he had, uh, where he was at the center, he had wanted to see his father, but his father now was too frightened to come and pick him up because of the things that he did to the village. Uh, or um, uh, Eva, who I met in the DRC, who who, uh, 13 years old, uh, went to school one day, was abducted, subject to terrible uh, sexual violence, uh, forced nudity. And when she managed to escape, they found she was pregnant. Uh, she was taken by a truck driver to Pansy Hospital, where when I met her, she was carrying the baby. The baby was half her size, uh, 13 years old. 
uh, or um, uh, Aisha in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan who came to see me. Uh, her house had been bombed by aerial bombardment. Her school had been burnt by, by the Taliban. And still, despite all that, she was very keen to become a teacher. And she said nobody was going to stop her uh, from doing that. And she was a very sad girl, but she had an ambition. Um, or the Kenyan boy I met in, uh, in, in, uh, in Mogadishu who still had a bullet in his head and he was uh, recruited by the Al-Shabaab, ran away and was now with the TFG and wanted to come away with me. Uh, these are the hardest parts for all of us who work in the field is when, when they want to come away with you and you cannot do anything for them. So these horrible uh, uh, stories, a young Palestinian boy in detention, a, a baby-faced young boy uh, who was throwing uh, stones and was in detention. And, and then I, for some reason, uh, he insisted that he didn't do anything wrong. He should throw stones and he will fight and martyrdom. And then when I started to, he looked so incredulous when I started to talk to him about Mahatma Gandhi. I don't think I sold him on it, but anyway, I began the, uh, began the conversation. Um, but these children, I always, when I leave them, I wonder, will they heal? You know, you really wonder, all of us, I think my staff, especially who also get very close to these children, will they heal? There's a school of thought that thinks resilience alone is enough, that, you know, just leave them alone, they will heal. But I think research is showing that in societies where there is no structured healing process, they are more likely to return to war. Uh, so there is need for, um, for healing, uh, for structured process. Uh, and uh, coming from my own country, Sri Lanka, as you know, which went through a terrible war, I really think that healing requires a partnership between lawyers and artists. Uh, lawyers, because we need justice. The child victims need justice. Uh, the perpetrators have to be told that they have uh, had uh, field remorse. They have to have a sense of what was what was done was wrong. Uh, but of course, for child perpetrators, we urge a restorative justice process, something that is more rehabilitation oriented. But still, an acknowledgement of the crimes that have been done, and and that uh, legal process or a truth and accountability process is very essential for children and for societies. But artists, a society, you know, begins to heal when its creative energies are begin to flow again, both at the individual and the state level. I don't know if you heard on NPR recently about a Sierra Leone young girl who has become a ballerina, who that was her way of healing, uh, or this young child soldiers in Sierra Leone who, who have formed a theater company. Uh, I remember uh, going uh, to paintings of children in Gaza. The first thing they did after Operation Cast Lead was to, was to have the children draw, and the paintings themselves were a healing process, and some of the paintings were quite uh, horrific, I must say. Um, and in Sri Lanka, too, I remember when there was terrorist violence, uh, uh, many of us, uh, many of the artists in Sri Lanka, and uh, some of us organized that, got together from all communities, and they would go to the spot where the terrorist incident took place, and they would paint symbols of peace and togetherness. Uh, and it was a way of us dealing with the, the tragedy. It was also a way of, of, of and passers-by would come and join uh, in that painting. Or the butterfly garden in the eastern part of Sri Lanka where children were used to art therapy and they were the ones who actually did heal, the ones who really had this kind of uh, art therapy. So let me say that artists play a very important role in creating the symbols the climate and the space for peace and healing. I have often felt that they fail to play a very important role. So when um, Ambassador Grouse gave me this opportunity, I thought perhaps my last conversation should be about art. Uh, and that's why we have someone here who will now tell us about the role of art and healing and how the focus of creativity uh, can help us overcome some of the horrors and destruction of war. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Radhika, for this very comprehensive and very convincing answer to uh, the questions I, uh, uh, I, I asked you. And uh, it shows that uh, what you have been doing is, uh, is, uh, is, is really impressive. And uh, at times it was also a very moving uh, testimony of certain experiences. Uh, you had over the last years. Thank you very, very much. In fact, you opened the way uh, to uh, Lucas Perron. Uh, perhaps, uh, Lucas, you can say something about what uh, 
your experiences are uh, music and uh, and conflict uh, music uh, arts and and, and politics uh, uh, and tell us also what makes music so special uh, uh, that it can uh, be used as um, uh, an instrument to help young people to uh, overcome uh, the traumas of uh, situations uh, uh, they have known. And what can music, uh, in your case music, or more generally uh, art, what can music or art offer them? Uh, what type of new prospects uh, after experiencing uh, war or, or, or violence? Uh, perhaps you can offer us some ideas on these questions. Okay. I see a big expectancy in your eyes, Mrs. Komaraswamy. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a bit difficult for me. Thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, uh, some of these ideas and uh, maybe I should start to explain a little bit uh, how how I came to work in this field of bringing music, taking music as a let's say maybe humanitarian tool, as a tool of development, as a um, as a tool uh, for working with uh, young people, children and, and adolescents who are in difficult circumstances, uh, also in conflict and uh, but not only in poverty and conflict. Um, I'm um, director of a music ensemble which is famous in, in Europe called ICTUS. So I know the, uh, on a day to day basis I'm living in, uh, in, the, in the music, in the music field with musicians. And uh, with this ensemble, uh, seven, eight years ago, we started a music fund. And um, it started in the, in the West Bank and uh, in Gaza uh, where they needed instruments. And, uh, now we're working uh, very actively in Kinshasa, in Mozambique, in the north of Morocco. We're planning a, a big project in uh, Haiti, we, which we hope we can start next year. Uh, in a few words, uh, the project is uh, quite simple, not in its realization, but uh, to explain it's simple. Uh, we focus on the instrument. To make music, you need an instrument. Uh, even if you sing, you need to be accompanied by instruments. So, and in uh, many of these places, they, have, uh, they need instruments. They, don't, they have difficulties finding them because they don't have the money or because of the, the situation with the conflict and uh, uh, it's difficult to get hold of them. So uh, what we just started to do, and it's now very successful all over Europe, we have these uh, 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 collecting campaigns of music instruments, which uh, which are collected by uh, organizations, uh, some of them very famous, like the Scala of Milano, and uh, they organize days in which uh, uh, the population is asked to bring an instrument to do, to make a donation of their instrument, instruments they play themselves or their children, their children played, or maybe somebody who who is not there anymore died, and uh, it's the instrument stays in the family. Uh, and uh, they donate it to Music Fund, and um, it's a, s a special gift because uh, this instrument is carrying um, uh, memories, uh, memories, dear memories, because making music is something dear to the people who make music. And some, when these people uh, uh, separate themselves from, from their instrument, they uh, very concretely, in their imagination, they already travel with the instrument to these places where the instrument will go to. And we allow them to uh, to also find out about where the instrument goes to because when the instrument is donated, it's identified, it gets a code, and uh, the donors they can if they want, and many do, contact Music Fund afterwards to find out where it where it went to, uh, and um, and so they can they can in their imagination connect to these faraway places where where kids uh, in difficult circumstances can thanks to this donation also make music, but then quickly we we. We, we worked uh, further on this on this uh, problematic because having instruments, uh, we repair them before we send them. Um, sending instruments to places like Kinshasa and uh, and uh, or Gaza or so it's really complicated. So it's a lot of work, and uh, it's uh, um, uh, knowing then that there's no nobody to take care of these instruments afterwards. Uh, 
uh, was worry, worrying us, and uh, and um, so we started uh, very quickly if, uh, after after two years of, of creating the organization to train technicians, and this has become our, our main interest and our main focus uh, of Music Fund is we we are training in all these different places uh, repair technicians. It's a very wonderful uh, profession, very specialized. Uh, we teach uh, people uh, how to become piano tuners, how to 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 repair guitars. Uh, uh, string instruments, wind instruments, and uh, and it takes years before they become uh, they they learn this profession. Um, and um, so this as an introduction to to music fund, and uh, doing developing these projects, we came to these places. We got to know them very well because we have to send uh, regularly uh, experts there to teach. Uh, a place like Kinshasa I know now very well because I often accompanied uh, experts and, and then started to understand also the important place that music can have in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in these regions. And um, from the beginning when, when we started Music Fund we were, we were told this by I, I would say the general population. Uh, how wonderful it is to to bring music uh, how that music would it's like a hypothesis that many people believe in uh, that music um, uh, in French we say uh, adoucit les mœurs uh, how would you say that in English uh, that it's it's it softens people or it brings people brings them closer to peaceful thoughts and uh, uh, my first my first personal uh, reaction to this was that I, I felt it was exaggerated and that uh, um, except that over over the years over these last seven eight years um, I have come back on my own skepticism because being confronted with uh, the fact first of all that there's so many people I, I guess it's all over the world that love music and that would do anything to be able to express oneself uh, through music and parents who want to do really big effort, make very big efforts to 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 send their children uh, to schools to, to where they can learn music uh, is on, on itself really something very very impressive. And um, uh, we see in Kinshasa, for example, people spending hours to get to the only music school of of, of the city and. Uh, not having the money to to buy instruments and having to go there also to learn and to to practice uh, on their instruments because they don't have them at, at home so it's um, you see that it's really music uh, is there a, a wonderful um, tool for development also because uh, there is there is research exists about uh, already about uh, how music uh, helps uh, students to to excel in in other disciplines like mathematics, and uh, there is a related study which 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 is of interest now to us uh, in in our field, uh, which uh, indicates that uh, this intuition, this hypothesis that that people uh, feel, and on which a lot of these practices are being being developed. Um, might uh, might might have a ground of of, of reality and um, um, so maybe this is enough as a first in introduction and we can go on maybe to questions and thank you very much uh, uh, mr peron the healing effect of uh, of music thank you very much for sharing these uh, experiences with us i think uh, time has come to open up the floor uh, in the meantime, may I also welcome two good colleagues sitting here, the ambassadors of uh, Algeria and uh, Luxembourg. Thank you for, for being here. So the floor is open. The floor is, uh, is yours. <coughs> the ambassador of Algeria. Thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Graus, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to listen to uh, uh, directly from Radika how she assesses the evolution of the, the uh, 
problematic of the children and armed conflict at the time she is living. I'm taking the floor first, not because the successor of uh, Radika <laughs> will be from Algeria, uh, but uh, maybe there is a little bit of that. I consider uh, that we are, we had already a representative in the post with you, uh, uh, Radika. Uh, the, uh, we, we are all together in this uh, uh, problematic, whatever our uh, citizenship. Uh, I had the chance to be serving in the Security Council at the time of the adoption of 1612. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed all those, uh, the, the interest of the membership of the council you have uh, accurately described on uh, how we should dedicate special attention to this uh, uh, issue. I have uh, 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 been, as you know, involved in uh, the, the various aspects of the problematic on the African and Arab uh, uh, issues. Seven years later, one can uh, maybe it's start drawing, uh, uh, taking stock of what has been achieved and where we uh, are heading. I'm sure the uh, uh, guidelines you have provided and the very important thought you have developed uh, will help your uh, successor uh, in uh, uh, indicating what's uh, the new uh, uh, effort required from all of us. Uh, I would like for uh, uh, myself to, to, to raise uh, a related issue. The situation of children in armed conflict uh, has its uh, specific requirement, recruitment, and uh, we must be rigorous concerning the, the, the uh, uh, aspect of uh, human rights violation and uh, crime against humanity. All those aspects are of utmost importance. As chair of 77, however, <laughs> I was thinking, is the situation of children outside the time of armed conflict better? Is, sorry? Is the situation of the children in time of peace, to say so, is it uh, fundamentally better than <coughs> those in uh, 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 caught in the middle of the armed conflict? Uh, uh, I would like to, to, to uh, uh, seek the views of uh, you, Radika, on this. Uh, we War could be could could uh, have different forms. I mean, uh, we have we are uh, concerned with the, uh, the the fragility of the children in front of the drug issue, with the <laughs> other the the, uh, <coughs> the, the net networked criminality and all those issues, and also uh, uh, in terms of uh, the fragility of the children in front of underdevelopment. Those issues, how could it be related to the work of the office, if I can ask? And finally, uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the, the contribution of art to the uh, global reintegration effort. Last month, uh, together with Jan, we were in, uh, in Jeddah, and we have been presented with this young man who uh, uh, recovered from the, the scourge of terrorism through the plastic arts. Today it was music, but definitely the art is uh, playing and increasing uh, an important role in the efforts of reintegration of the vulnerable categories. Thank you. Right. Did I have some Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think in the 1990s, um, because people felt that children living in situations of armed conflict were suffering horrendous violations, they felt that it required urgent attention. That was different from children living in peacetime. 
Uh, and I think what, what you have is one, you have certain kinds of violations that take place that are absolutely shock the conscience violations in situations of armed conflict. Uh, one, you have the killing and maiming of children. Secondly, you often have the recruitment of children as child soldiers. Uh, thirdly, uh, you have sexual violence against children. You have attacks on their schools uh, and hospitals. Uh, you have denial of humanitarian access to them, uh, abductions. All these are accentuated in a situation of armed conflict, which is different to peacetime. And it was felt that you put so many ch children become so much at risk in context of armed conflict to these terrible, grave, violent forms of abuses that it required specific uh, attention. But also, even if we don't look at that, if you don't look only at the horrendous, if you look at even go to the Millennium Development Goals, in situations of armed conflict, it is countries that are in armed conflict that have the worst uh, MD, uh, MDG indicators, the least amount of uh, children in school, uh, the least um, uh, uh, malnourishment, all that, you see? So, so armed conflict is a very specific context that is where children become extremely vulnerable. And it's for this reason, I think, we're also seeing the wars in, in the 1990s that uh, it was decided to ask Rasa Michelle to write this report on the study. She made, the, you know, she wrote this report on the study of children in armed conflict from which all this flows. It is her report that is the basis of all our work. Uh, and that uh, showed very clearly that children in situations of armed conflict were subject to a great deal of abuse uh, and, and a different intensity of abuse than children in peacetime. Not to mention that there are no children in peacetime issues that would be of, uh, that are not of concern. There is a special representative on violence against children to deal with those issues. But armed conflict had very specialized uh, areas. Mr. Kridelka, the representative of UNESCO here in New York. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Gross, for moder moderating this discussion, and thank you very much, uh, Special Representative, uh, also for the excellent partnership that at UNESCO we have had with you and, and with your team. Something that is perhaps less known in, in this room is that you have taken many initiatives also to organize interagency task teams here in New York, and we all know that delivering as one is a priority of the UN system. I just wanted to ask you if, if you retain a few challenges or success stories from those, uh, this interagency uh, cooperation that you have tried to promote, and if you have any advice to agencies or funds and programs uh, in order to uh, enhance the way we cooperate uh, to help you and to help your successor in, in your mission. And of course, the importance of art and music for uh, <laughs> uh, uh, contributing to peace is well noted by UNESCO. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to take this question now? Yes. Thank you, uh, and thank UNESCO for their partnership. I think one model of uh, interagency working together was in Nepal um, with, the, with the type of uh, program that came after the, uh, you know, first in negotiating with the Maoists uh, to, to get uh, children released, uh, I think, and also uh, uh, in the reintegration program. And the reason for that is the country team was united and very strong. And everybody pulled their weight. I think that was what was important. Um, and everybody was very actively involved. And so that it really was, uh, and they, both the, the resident coordinator and the UNICEF representative were very strongly committed to bringing all the partners in, including ILO and UNDP and all these people. So, so in that sense, the, that I think was one success story of UN delivering as one, and I think has been recognized as such uh, as well. Mr. Perron, uh, did you, uh, would you like to comment? Yes, I just would like to maybe um, say a few words on, um, again, following this intu intuition, um, how, how uh, music could, could play a role, really. And um, uh, it, it needs research, but uh, at the same time, there's so much practice already around, uh, proving uh, wonderful results. And um, in, in, in uh, Congo, um, I have been talking now with people who are in the east, northeast of Congo, in Bunya, in Dungu, working with uh, child soldiers, and have uh, started to introduce music, uh, not as a as a as a as a full training study, uh, but uh, um, in in workshops in uh, um, 
and they have uh, they have experienced very remarkable uh, reactions of children. Um, how it, it suits them, it calms them, it's, uh, uh, it's, it opens them up to, uh, to other also, uh, to, to be attentive to other propositions that they receive. So uh, it, uh, it, would, yes, it would encourage us to, to develop this further and to, to, uh, to offer real uh, music education, study, the study of music. Uh, uh, what could the study of music do to, or what do we see now that the study of music does to, to young people who are uh, lost to very lost uh, in the case of, of, of child soldiers who have uh, gone through so, such horrible, horrible experiences before, is that to, when you study music, when you, when you learn how to, to master an instrument, it takes, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of concentration, a focus, discipline also. Um, it's uh, having a, a very important impact on your personality. It's going quite deep in, uh, in uh, before you learn, when you get first results of uh, playing uh, any instrument, uh, a violin, guitar, whatever uh, instrument. Uh, it's, uh, you go through a whole process that, that is uh, uh, putting building block on building block, uh, which is a very constructive, per definition, a very constructive uh, process uh, that you go through. If you then also um, uh, want to learn how to play together with others, uh, again, there wh whatever music you, you would like to play, uh, there's something which is always there, which is uh, you learn if you want to play together. You have to go into dialogue with with other other musicians, and you will have to uh, make some uh, arrangements about some. There will be some some form of rules, and and sometimes they become they can become like very complex, like in the classical form of forms of music, like Indian music or Arabic or Western classical music. But anyway, it's always there. Also, even in jazz music and and uh, improvisation music, there's also this part of making arrangements, uh, uh, learning at the end of the day a very uh, a set of uh, communicative tools. And as music is uh, taking a lot of this energy and a lot of your time and, and it has a, quite an important place in your life if you, if you, uh, if you wish and if you, if you become passionate about it, it will, for sure, again, it's intu an intuitive feeling that many people have and that needs research now, but uh, it will, for sure, have an impact on the rest of your life, of your, uh, uh, how, how you deal with uh, your, out your outlook on, on what the rest of your life could give. And, um, Thank you. Joe Becky. Thank you, Mr. Peron. Yes, please. My name is Joe Becker, I'm with Human Rights Watch. And from the outset, I wanna say from an NGO perspective, what a pleasure it's been to work with the SRSG over these last six years, and how much we've appreciated her leadership and her vision, and how much she's accomplished for the children in armed conflict agenda. Yeah. And um, you mentioned you know, a number of the successes of the last six years, and certainly you know, as someone who's been working on the children in armed conflict agenda for quite a while, we've seen some real tangible steps forward. Um, the action plans, um, children being demobilized, I think this is one agenda where we can really see tangible <laughs> progress. Um, but thinking forward, you mentioned some challenges for your successor. Galvanizing political will, consolidating the MRM, but I wonder if you would say just a little bit more looking forward on what you see as the biggest obstacles to future progress. If we want to see the agenda continuing to move forward over the next six years, what would you say would be the, the biggest uh, blockages to really uh, continuing the forward momentum? Very good question, if I may say so. <laughs> Radhika, not easy to answer. <laughs> well, I think... Um, I, th I think the obstacle, I wouldn't call it an obstacle, but I, I would say that basically we've moved very fast. Uh, and uh, the point is that uh, we have to make sure that all the member states come with us, uh, or the vast majority come with us. Um, and to me, the concern is that um, by misunderstanding and by uh, 
my individual spoiler action or whatever the uh, the the mandate might be pushed backwards and that i think is the thing so the main ob objective i think is to make sure that nothing is pushed backwards if this mandate it stays where it is and uh, has strength where it is uh, and basically it was you know it, it was uh, sometimes people say these are northern mandates but it's not this mandate came out of africa and clearly out of africa grassa michelle and olaro tuno people who had this vision were, were, were African, you know. So it's important to, to have that uh, support and, and to move uh, forward uh, in that score. So I would say the politics of the UN is the biggest obstacle. Uh, and I think uh, that's why uh, I hope, uh, I know that uh, my success, I had a discussion with her this morning. She seems wonderful. Uh, so I'm really happy to leave it in her hands. Uh, and uh, feel satisfied that the agenda will move forward, uh, and I think she, she, you know, she understands that, uh, and I, and I also think, being African herself, she can revive that uh, that uh, that uh, political will as well, uh, because the technical stuff will move very fast, because the technical stuff, uh, as I said, I have, my team is uh, excellent, UNICEF is on board, the NGOs are active. So the technical stuff maybe requires a little more, uh, you know, refinement and training and you know, tuning and all that. But it's ready to go. But it's the politics uh, that's the obstacle, uh, and the politics requires every all of us to work to reassure states that this is not the end of the world, that these are important issues, uh, and to to build that trust. Jeremy. Ambassador, and uh, thank you, uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy, for sharing your thoughts and, uh, and this reflection, notably on healing and reconciliation issues. Uh, I would have two questions. The, the first one, building on uh, the, the question that was just raised before, uh, being somebody who follows a bit the, the, the issue of uh, children and armed conflict, as many of us in this room, uh, I know that one of the obstacles on the way uh, remains this question, this issue of persistent perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Those perpetrators who've been on the list of shame, as you, uh, as you call it, uh, for the last five years. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about this and uh, share your thoughts on what's the way forward to address uh, this issue and to, to, um, to bring those persistent perpetrators on the, on the right path? And my second question is on the, the healing and reconciliation aspect. Um, and it is addressed to you, uh, Madam Kumaraswamy. Uh, could you put uh, a bit in, in perspective the, the experience that uh, Luca Perron shared with us um, uh, with other initiatives aimed at healing and reconciliating populations, and particularly children affected by, by conflict, other than in the artistic world, maybe, but are there also other um, ways to, to work on healing and reconciliations in, uh, in those contexts? Thank you very much. Well, with, with regard to the issue of persistent perpetrators, um, I think uh, first we have to deconstruct this category. Um, so the first category are governments and national armies that recruit children. Now, I think this, we just have to get rid of that for sure. By 2016, there should not be any national army that has children, uh, or at least. I mean, that should be, and there are only a very few. Uh, most are in the process of now signing an action plan, or, um, or, or I think there are one or two. Now, Yemen was added this year, so I don't know. Uh, uh, but anyway, we should get governments off this uh, list. Uh, then the second issue is uh, what do we do with those uh, perpetrators who who have sent signals, but maybe governments are not giving permission for us to meet them, or they are uh, sending mixed signals. This category, I think we have to do uh, diplomatic work and political work, try to meet them, get them on board, get them to sign action plans, and get them to go. Then we're left, left with the hardcore who don't care. Uh, and so what do we do with them? I think that group, we have to think about the whole sanctions process. Uh, uh, I think to some extent, and that's why I refer to you to De La Sablier's uh, report about how one can move forward perhaps on that. He gives some ideas in that. And also maybe uh, one of the ideas he does give is to share information with 
the ICC and national courts, national courts or, who are or national prosecutors in these countries, uh, the information that we get. So that, you know, they're tried in some court of law, maybe if they don't want international, then at least in the country of origin, the information is shared. So these are some of the things that one, uh, I think my successor will have to look into. But if we can also get the first two categories moving as well, so that then we really isolate the hardcore that will refuse to sign and who are contemptuous of the international community, then I think uh, we can take strong action uh, against them. The second question on initiatives of healing, um, uh, of course, I like the artist ones, but if you want other initiatives, of course, there are things, as you know, there are um, uh, use of local customs and practices in some parts to help with the healing. Uh, in northern Uganda, I think they have tried that. In Angola, they have tried that, and it's worked in some areas. Uh, so, so there are also um, uh, healing pr uh, programs where you make the children do service. You know, how do you make, say, child perpetrators uh, of violence? How do you heal them? And one of the things suggested is that they do some service to the community on a regular basis for a year or two, so they, so they understand remorse, but also express, uh, do something for the community, positive, since they have been destructive, et cetera. So there are a lot of initiatives out there doing things, especially with children, uh, for healing. Uh, but of course, uh, Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation uh, process for children also very instructive uh, with regard to healing as well. Perhaps, if I may, um, a question on, on your relationship, um, not within the UN family, because that was touched upon, I mean, your relationship to, between your office and, and other UN bodies and, and, and agencies. But uh, my question would be about the relationship between uh, you and your office with other organizations, uh, be they regional organizations or other organizations, because I think it is important for you to have alliances also in other uh, uh, international organizations. Could you say something about that? Yes, well, during, uh, we have developed to some extent some uh, linkages with the EU uh, uh, and NATO and the AU and its peacekeeping operations. Now, with regard to the EU, as you know, they're, they're up center with guidelines on children in armed conflict and a, and a whole process with children in armed conflict that they do. Uh, and as you know, NATO, in its latest summit, uh, we managed to get them to adopt a uh, child protection declaration so that in their operations, they would involve child protection would be an important part of their operations and they would not, uh, so that was important. We're now in the form of trying to do the same thing with the AU through the special advisor uh, on Africa. We've just begun that process and we're trying to work at some point in uh, for next year's summit to try and get a similar kind of declaration and to make sure that AU peacekeepers also, like the NATO, peace, uh, NATO uh, uh, forces would also have uh, some training in child protection and child protection issues. So these are some of the, and the more the peacekeepers go out there, the more we, we really feel it's very important that they have child protection expertise, because more and more of these wars are internal wars involving a lot of consequences for children. Any further comments, questions, suggestions? If, if that is not the case, I think uh, time has come to conclude. I always call uh, Radhika une grande dame des Nations Unies. You all understand this. You can only express this feeling in French, I think. <laughs> une grande dame des Nations Unies. I think she superbly represented the United Nations, its values, its ideals, its mandate also, her mandate, her mandate. And uh, for once, I feel like a plenipotentiary 
we have that in our title, Ambassador Plenipotentiary, and, uh, but I'm sure that I speak on behalf of all of you when I say that uh, we have listened to you with uh, great attention. You have uh, noticed that, but I think we also have the greatest admiration and respect for what you did over these last years. Thank you. Uh, you're leaving a wonderful legacy, I think, to all of us, not just to the organization, but all to, also to, to the member states. And uh, we all keep very fond memories of working with you and with your staff, uh, speaking uh, from my personal experience. Uh, having uh, discussions and meetings with you was also, was each time and every time uh, a great moment. Um, so thank you for all that. Um, you have given a lot of children in this world uh, a new future, a new perspective in life. And uh, I think that is a, a wonderful feeling, I guess, for you. Uh, and uh, on behalf of these children, uh, also thank you very much. Um, you will have the continued support of the group of friends of Children and Armed Conflict, uh, because uh, we have worked together very intensively over these last years. And please tell your successor uh, that that good cooperation, uh, we all want to uh, continue that. So thank you again for having been here with us, for having shared your experiences. Uh, uh, I think it was very impressive what you said, and uh, very convincing also. Uh, honestly, you're leaving a, a great legacy and up to all of us to uh, keep this in mind. And uh, I think lastly, but uh, perhaps oh, my goodness. not least importantly, <laughs> I would like to hand over these flowers Thank to you. you. hope you will give my successor the support you have given me uh, and I, I will I will definitely watch my spirit is guy with you in this mandate and will watch over you as well thank you thank you so much uh. meeting is adjourned